We often talk about listening to your gut, about following a gut feeling. That's because our gut is pretty smart. It grabs what it needs. It constantly is rebuilding itself. It tends to kick out unwanted bacteria, the toxins. The thing is, right from the beginning, even before you're born, injuries and infections can really mess up even a tiny baby's gut. And if that gut is too hurt to absorb nutrients, it's really hard for that baby to grow and thrive. That's where Dr. Amanda Hall wants to find ways to help. She's our guest today on Researchers Under the Scope. I'm your host, Jen Cannell, and we are at the Health Sciences Building at the University of Saskatchewan's College of Medicine today. And Dr. Amanda Hall joins us. She is a pediatric surgeon. She is an assistant professor of pediatric general surgery, and her work focuses specifically on the tiniest people and short gut syndrome. And she joins us now. Hello, Amanda. Hi, Jen. Thanks for having me. What is short gut syndrome and what causes it? So shortcut syndrome, by definition, means that you either have inadequate intestinal length, your intestine is just literally too short, or you don't have enough absorptive capacity or surface. So even though your intestine is technically long enough, it doesn't absorb nutrients. And this can happen for a number of different reasons. It's a very heterogeneous disease, although it's all grouped under the title of shortcut. So sometimes it can be from a congenital issue, such as a baby was born missing a piece of their gut, so literally short gut. Sometimes it can be after a baby suffers a severe infection of their intestine, and the intestine, although it's technically long enough, never recovers function. Sometimes the baby can be born with a genetic mutation, where although the gut is all physically there, it just doesn't work and it doesn't absorb. And sometimes it can be after a trauma or a blood clot, where again you lose a large amount of intestine and the gut is, again, too short to function. So all of those different scenarios are grouped together under short gut syndrome. And the kind of trauma that you just mentioned, that could be like from a, a big hit, like maybe in a car accident or somehow the baby is hurt right in their gut region? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Or sometimes from another, another surgery, sometimes after a cancer scenario. The majority of these, the cases who have short gut syndrome are diagnosed in infancy, so trauma is much less common. But technically, short gut can happen at any time in your life. I focus on the population of babies. I know you grew up in Meadow Lake. When and at what point did you decide, okay, I'm going to research very small people and what's happening inside their gut? Oh, <laughs> that was much later. Um, I've always wanted to be a pediatric surgeon, basically, since grade 8. Way back when, in grade eight, there was a show filmed out of Sick Kids, uh, which is the big children's hospital in Toronto. And this is the show is called Life's Little Miracles. And they would film a child through their surgical journey. So they'd film from the start, where they see the surgeon at the start, receive a diagnosis, make a surgical plan. They'd actually go into the OR and film the surgeries, which was amazing. And then they'd show the cute little kid running around afterwards. So I had all those episodes taped on VHS, and I decided that's what I wanted to do. So I went into medicine planning to do pediatric surgery. <laughs> like how, where did you even hear about the show? Like how did you end up watching it? We only had like two or three channels back then, so <laughs> that's how I ran into it. <laughs> and you started hitting record because like the episodes were that good? Yeah, they were amazing, and I had no idea that it was, a, it was even an option as a career. No one in my family is in health sciences, so... I had no idea this was a thing, but I latched on really quickly, and that was what I wanted to do. And so, okay, you, you come to the U of S, you do your undergrad, you apply, and yes, they accept you to the College of Medicine, things go all right. But would you say that throughout that journey, like, did you have any people like, or events that sort of became your TSN turning points? I would say one of my biggest mentors is Dr. Miller, who is one of the pediatric surgeons here at University of Saskatchewan. I was very fortunate that he took me under his wing to start my research career back when I was in second year of residency, and he was not at all concerned that I had no background in research. 
I was willing to learn and he was willing to teach. <laughs> that makes such a difference, doesn't it? Yes, it was, it was really amazing. In terms of deciding to be both a clinician and to do research, that is not something you see every day. How did that come about for you? So that was kind of an accident. Honestly, I didn't plan to become a researcher. It kind of, it kind of just uh, happened. I found out that to get into pediatric surgery training, you would need to have at least a graduate degree. So I started out doing my master's with Dr. Miller as my supervisor and Dr. Zello as well from the College of Nutrition. And halfway through my master's, I discovered I just loved research. I loved the the struggle, the unending nights of work, and then finally that amazing feeling when you see numbers that make sense and results that suddenly give you an answer for something you've been looking at. What were you looking at at that point? So in my graduate studies, Dr. Miller w- was looking at parental nutrition-associated liver disease in infants. So basically that's babies who can't eat or have any nutrition in their gut. They have to have all the nutrition come through the IV and... Back when I did my research, which is now over a decade ago, this IV nutrition would basically poison the liver. Oh! And so if babies were on this nutrition for longer than a couple months, they'd start to get jaundiced, yellow, and eventually go into liver failure. And if that couldn't be reversed, they needed a transplant. So we were looking at factors that were contributing to that liver disease. Uh, Why do babies get liver disease so quickly on this IV nutrition? What did you find? So... I was looking at two different factors, different types of fats or lipids, and then parental nutrition. I think, honestly, that's turned out to be the bigger factor, and many other labs have looked at that as well. I was also looking at the contaminants of parental nutrition, like aluminum, and we think that this is a multifactorial disease. It doesn't just come from one place. It's, oh, great. (laughs) In the past 10 years, though, there's been so many improvements in parental nutrition that the liver failure is now much, 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 much rarer. The lipids have been completely changed and the aluminum contamination has been removed. So congratulations. <laughs> I, I don't think I can take credit for that. <laughs> Not solely, but it, it, yeah. it does build better for small babies. But that when it comes to short gut syndrome, can you kind of walk us through how often you see it and what it means for that particular small baby? So short gut syndrome in infants is relatively rare. It's about 24 in every 100,000 babies born in Canada. So about 2 in 10,000-ish. It can come from a number of different factors, but what it means at the end of the day is that your intestine doesn't function. So either you don't have enough intestine or the intestine you do have doesn't work for some reason. And you'd notice it because the baby is starting to have like what diarrhea or they're just not putting on weight? Exactly. Yeah, they would have what we call failure to thrive. So they're not they're not able to get the nutrition they need. They don't gain weight. They have uncontrollable diarrhea. They might have vomiting. So all these things that show us that the gut just isn't working. What do you do then? Like, how do you treat a patient then right now? So right now, our options are unfortunately very limited. We basically support the baby and hope that eventually the gut adapts. So support means IV nutrition. So these babies are often fed through the IV. And about 50, 50% of them will eventually adapt over a period of a couple years. And eventually the bowel will recover and grow and get enough of those absorptive villi that they can get enough nutrients. On the other side of that coin is the 50% who don't adapt. And it doesn't matter how long you wait and they won't adapt. Of those, um, the options are a bowel transplant, which is... Um, a very complex and risky surgery. And unfortunately, 38% of babies with short bowel syndrome will succumb to their disease. Short gut syndrome is a spectrum of different gut failure presentations. And so some babies can take a small amount of nutrients, whether it's from breast milk or whether it's from another form. Some babies, their gut will not tolerate anything in there. And so no nutrients can go in there or they'll have significant side effects. Some babies can only tolerate nutrients that have been broken down to the very basic amino acid level. Um, so that's the only kind of nutrients that their gut can tolerate. 
So certainly if they tolerate breast milk, that's something we want to give because of all the different benefits of breast milk. But a lot of these babies were very limited on what we can actually physically put into the gut that they will tolerate. And what is going on with the gut? And I mean, even in relation to other organs, what sets it apart? Um, so the gut is a fascinating organ. It not only is responsible for our nutrients, our hydration, it's also a huge immunological organ. It grows and adapts based on your nutrients and your requirements. It also harbors a huge, well-balanced um, microbacterial biome. I'm, th I'm thinking like a little zoo or like a menagerie of all these different plants and, and things that are living in it that have a place there, that belong there. Yeah, it's really not a static organ. It's constantly changing, constantly adapting, except in these babies. For some reason, it is not adapting, and that's what we want to investigate. How can we improve the gut adaptation and help the gut recover from these different insults? How do you figure that out? So that's where my research is coming in. Um, so hopefully by using our organoids as a model for human intestine, we can look at different beneficial gut factors. So things like certain probiotics or certain factors in breast milk or certain drugs and see if we can improve how quickly the organoids grow, how quickly they produce different hormones and, and different growth factors. And then hopefully eventually extrapolate those to the clinical setting. And can you take us back a step? Where do organoids enter the picture? So organoids... And, and what, what the heck is an organoid? <laughs> <laughs> so organoids are a fascinating uh, model for biological sciences. So uh, let's head down to the lab and I can show you what these little organoids look like. My lab space is quite small, but it has everything we need. So when we walk in the door, you'll see that there's our incubator, and then we passage them and work with them outside the incubator, and then we turn them to the incubator. Okay. So. And they're basically like synthetic organs. <laughs> Miniature organs. They're not synthetic. They're real. They're completely the same tissues as you would find in your intestine. They're just in tiny little spherical shape. Really? Yeah. That is so cool. And they're indistinguishable. Oh, she said she's going to ask me. We take stem cells from the intestine. We all have stem cells that allow our gut to proliferate and replace every couple days. And we trigger them to develop into intestinal cells. And then those intestinal cells are grown into a tiny sphere about the end of a pencil, pencil lead. And that sphere is a functioning mini intestine. So we don't want people randomly opening up our incubator because they might just upset our stem cells and then we'll die. What are you looking for? Oh, I'm looking for the one done by my lab tech. But you can actually see those, those little white spots in the bottom of the well. Oh! Those are, each little white spot is an organoid. Hello, so organoids. You can technically see them. Yeah, Just they, if I took a pencil and made like a tiny little mark. Yeah. That's about. <laughs> they look like little grains of sand. Yeah. So, but they're certainly not, they're certainly not, um, invisible to the naked eye, so that kind of helps. We can tell where they are. And they live in a little gel dome, which helps them maintain their 3D format because they don't live in a flat surface. They want to be in 3D, so they live in a little jello dome. What do organoids eat? Uh, very expensive media, <laughs> which needs, they need to be fed every couple days or they will outgrow their food sources and die. Oh. Oh dear. So, um, you can look through the eyepieces to see here. I'll just get you a bigger magnification. Sure. Yeah, I get there. So, you're looking at a whole bunch of little bubbles. Yeah, it, it kind of does remind me of rice. Yeah. <laughs> and each bubble has a really thick wall. So, you can see there's... Yeah, it's like somebody did the walls in, like, black marker. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, that thick wall is actually an entire wall of cells. So, you're actually looking through a sphere and you're seeing the outer wall of the sphere there. Some of them look like they're sort of bigger and more robust than others. They sort of have like, I would almost describe it as like little pillow folds happening all yes. over them. Yes, some of them have little buds coming out of them. And so that is what we call microvilli. So these are actually forming little fingers, which in an intestine would be millions of little fingers. Oh, the ones that reach out to, like, I want the food, give me the food. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's it, that they're forming little buds, and those buds are the fingers. So these little 
intestinal organoids actually have fingers, microvilli. And how long will they live inside their gel dome homes? For as long as we keep them alive and happy. So they can be, they're technically immortal. Um, as long as you keep feeding them the expensive media. <laughs> and then as they get bigger, we have to split them. Just like you would uh, split a plant that grows too big. Um, yeah, these ones are a little bit bigger. They'll get much, maybe three times the size of this, and then when they're that size, they need to be split or they will be too big to maintain. In some ways, I could see them sort of taking on mini baby characteristics. They do need a lot of attention, a lot of feeding, <laughs> and they grow quite remarkably, so just like a baby. <laughs> and they're also very cute, like a baby. Oh. And uh, definitely you become attached to them because they require a lot of work, a lot of time, and a lot of expense. <laughs> How, how how much does it cost if I want to like get one organoid going? Can I can I use my own or do I have to special order? Like how do I how do I get one? Um, unfortunately, getting them from actual people is still experimental. Um, okay. So what our lab did is we purchased stem cells from a company in the United States, and then from those stem cells, we triggered them to become intestinal organoids and then grew them. So it's been over a year now to get to this stage. So that's why we're so invested in these little organoids. And do you have to make like a whole little crop of them before you can start actually doing research on them? Definitely, yeah. We have a whole library of them. The extra ones that you didn't see are frozen in liquid nitrogen. So those are the ones that are in waiting. Um, so any extras that we have that we don't need immediately, we freeze because they're very valuable to us. And we don't want to waste any of them. This sounds exactly like breast milk banks. I yes. <laughs> Again, very valuable things that you want to freeze and keep for posterity. <laughs> At this point, what's your working hypothesis in terms of potential treatments or potential ways we can help babies with short gut syndrome? So um, my hypothesis is that there are different factors in both breast milk and probiotics and other areas that we haven't even explored yet that can increase how quickly the bowel recovers and adapts. We know from other studies such as, there's a great study from McMaster, where they looked at babies who have gastroschisis, which is a congenital condition where babies are born with their intestine outside of their abdominal cavity. And these babies we know are at high risk for short gut syndrome. So they took these babies who are already at risk for short gut and gave them either breast milk or formula and found that those who had the breast milk recovered their gut faster, went home quicker. So that is what kind of triggered me to start looking at breast milk is potentially an aid for bowel adaptation. We know that breast milk does so many other things for the bowel, like helps with our immune function, helps with the actual integrity of the bowel. But I'm curious to know, does it actually help the bowel grow faster? Does it contain like the equivalent of growth hormones or something that would stimulate it? Oh, it contains many hormones for sure. Yes. <laughs> yes. Many factors. So um, we're looking at that. And then we're also looking at other things like certain probiotics because in other situations outside of gastroschisis, but where babies have had major infections to the gut, again, place them at risk for short gut syndrome. We know that those babies who are given probiotic mixes do better than those who don't. So we already have an inkling in our mind that these are gut-friendly helpers. I want to know why and how do they help the bowel to develop and to adapt faster. How do you test that? Like, do you feed the organoids little bits of breast milk or how do you, like, what do you give them? Um, so yes, we can expose the organoids to breast milk. We can expose them to bacteria. We can expose them to different factors from the breast, breast milk, perhaps just the lipids or just the hormones from them. And then we look at things like how quickly our transport is developed. Um, we look at markers of intestinal development. There are certain hormones that are produced when the intestine is adapting as opposed to when it's not. So we can look at those as well all different markers to say that perhaps if we gave that in a clinical setting, the baby's gut might actually adapt faster. At what point could you see that actually changing the protocols that we have for babies who have short gut syndrome? So I don't think it'll be as easy as saying every baby with short gut should get breast milk, uh, which <laughs> would be great. Um, but I think if we can identify certain factors in the breast milk or certain probiotics that are beneficial to help the gut um, adapt, that'll give us a few more options other than just supporting these babies, which is what we're doing now. 
and it's complicated too, you said, because it's multifactorial. There's not usually any one single thing that you could just tweak. Oh, here's the breast milk and oh, it's all fixed. It just doesn't work in such a simple way. Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> and every baby with short gut is a little bit different. So the idea of finding a universal cure is not very realistic. But if we can start identifying different factors to help and improve the process, I think that'll be very important. How does that work out when you're actually talking with the families of babies who have short gut syndrome or you're talking to their to their grown-ups? I mean, I've worked with a few families who have a child with short gut syndrome and universally they're looking for an option <laughs> because it's a very, very long, difficult road. Often they're stuck in hospital and there's no progress happening. So definitely they want another option. They're looking for anything that'll improve their chances of getting home and getting off of that IV nutrition. There are a few medications now out there that are being developed and being trialed. So there are def there's definitely hope on the horizon. I'm hoping to contribute to that as well. <laughs> Just in your day-to-day -day life, how do you balance your research side with being an active clinician and a surgeon? You're a pediatric surgeon who you operate on all sorts of kids. <laughs> yes, it's, uh, it's difficult and I rely heavily on my colleagues. I'm fortunate enough to work with three other pediatric surgeons and they're all very understanding of my research and support me in that. And that allows me to have a flexible schedule where I can dart down to the lab whenever I need to and come back and resume my clinical responsibilities afterwards. So it's it's just a day-to-day a -day trade flexibility and uh, relies a lot on help. <laughs> oh, wow. So you are busy. Yeah, it's a fascinating field. What keeps the research half of my practice going is my amazing research team. So I have an excellent research technician, Farinez, and I have a master's student, Nolan, and they do all the day-to-day -day maintenance and care of the organoids, and they're running the experiments, and I'm more in a supervisory role. So certainly without them, my research would stutter to a stop. <laughs> if you could go back in time and just like talk for a minute or two to the little girl who was watching TV in Meadow Lake... <laughs> <laughs> thinking I would really like to help kids like that. That seems like a really good thing to do with my life. Uh -huh. um, what would you tell her? Um, I'd say to keep her options open and to consider all possibilities and don't be too locked into one option because a little pediatric surgery certainly worked out and I don't regret going down that path. I would have liked to have looked at research earlier and had that earlier in my career. <laughs> Well, we're really glad that we have you now. So thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Dr. Amanda Hall is a pediatric surgeon and she's researching short gut syndrome. She's also an assistant professor of pediatric general surgery with the University of Saskatchewan's College of Medicine. To find out more about her work, go to medicine.usask.ca. Researchers Under the Scope is a presentation of the Office of the Vice Dean of Research, the OVDR, at the U of S College of Medicine. We record and produce this podcast on Treaty 6 territory, and we pay our respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place, reaffirming our relationship with one another. Well, we'd like to thank you for tuning in. We are going to take a short break over the Christmas week, but on New Year's Eve, you know what, we'll release a new episode with pediatric endocrinologist Munir Noor. All right, stay tuned for that one. And in the meantime, if you like Researchers Under the Scope and you think other people should hear it too, tell them about it. Send them the link. You can go to the show and make sure you're following us there. You can also copy a link to the show and then it's easy to text it to a friend. I'm your host, Jen Cannell. Have a wonderful rest of 2023 and we'll see you on New Year's Eve.